Hello, welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I love Daniel Day-Lewis. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss In The Name Of The Father, which released in 1993, based on the book by Jerry Conlon, written and directed by Jim Sheridan. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows Jerry Conlon's story as he was accused along with three others for the bombings in Guildford in 1974. After his father is arrested as well, they are both sent to prison and we follow their struggle to prove their innocence. Well, it's not even eight o'clock yet. So one of the first things to get kind of out the way, really, when talking about this film is that this is based on a true story. Yeah. Tr- true events, which actually occurred. But this film was heavily, heavily criticised for fictionalising and dramatising all of the events and playing them out of order, condensing things down and telling lies, mm. apparently. Mm. Now, there's... Very good reason for that, because almost every true story does that in film form anyway, because the true story doesn't always work well when you're trying to tell a dramatic story for film entertainment purposes. Yeah. So I kind of just go, okay, that's almost a given for any film at this point in time. Yeah. Um, But, you know, this film also was nominated for like seven Academy Awards. You know, best director, best actor, best best supporting actor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Like this film did amazingly well. Yeah. You know, I think it was on a budget of like sixteen million and gross nearly seventy million. It yeah. was really, really successful. However, it still kind of never escaped the stigma of being, you know, a, a, a lie. Yeah. Although the director has gone on to say, like, you know, he he had to 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 do those things because it made more sense in terms of telling the story and getting across what he needed to get across about this story of injustice, which we will get into. Well, the question is, I mean, did Jerry Conlon ever say that it was a lie? You know? No. Did he ever say that what happened in this film was completely fabricated and was a fantasy? Well, for instance, the two of them never went to the same prison. Well, I, and I, so there's like I read a big, that. Yeah. I read that in the notes that obviously... Um, Jerry Conlon and his father Giuseppe were sent to two separate prisons and they were kept away for most of the time. So the whole story that we follow of them in this movie is, yes, heavily fictional. But I'll also go on a limb and say that both of them were innocent and held in prison for 15 years. And the fact that they never saw each other up until the father died and so the son had to find out about this in prison. Oh, and by the way, no one's ever been really prosecuted for sending these two men to these two innocent men to prison. Um, so, you know what? Fuck y'all. Um, <laughs> but I have... Yeah, I've always loved Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, at a very young age, um, I watched uh, My Left Foot, starring Daniel Day-Lewis and being directed by Jim Sheridan. And I think for me, that was probably one of the first films that made me want to watch more films after I'd realised that the man playing the main character in the wheelchair didn't actually have that disability he was playing he was an actor and throughout my life the name Daniel Day-Lewis has just come up numerous times in numerous movies and if I haven't watched it I've had somebody screaming in my face saying you need to watch this movie it's so good and I'm like, really? Oh, it's only Daniel Day-Lewis. Oh, it is that good. Right? <laughs> you know? Daniel Day-Lewis is one of the finest actors of our time. Yes. You know, he's excellent. He, and he is, granted, he's a method actor. And he really puts himself in the roles. Well, that's what actors are supposed to do. You know, they're supposed to become that but character. But it was, I mean, there was, uh, I mean, we've not really got into the film yet. But yeah. it, go, yeah. going into, like, the true story, I mean, we, we, you'll know that Jerry Conlon is falsely arrested, Mm. is falsely sent to to prison. But Daniel Day-Lewis was like, uh, how do I convey this? How do I get through this? And so he literally put himself in a prison for three days. Yeah. He was physically... um, I mean, he wasn't complete. He wasn't physically beaten. No, no. But he was was tortured in the sense that they verbally abused him and threw cold water at him and kept him from sleeping for three days so that he could really feel 
like the mental state his character needs to be in. Yeah, he had to understand this character. And that's what I love about Daniel Day-Lewis is that every time I see him playing an actor, uh, playing a character in a film, he has spent an unknown amount of time becoming that person to convey us the story. And so like within the name of the father, I've seen it once a long time ago and I just, you know, I applauded it and never thought to ever go back because it stays with you. And then when Gary said, look, we're doing it for the review, I'm like, this is easy. You know, we read in the comment sections a lot of the time saying you guys should do a good movie. This is a good movie. <laughs> And this film will get your attention in the opening of the film. Yeah. With you just see some people going about their business. They're, it looks like they're going into a pub and then fucking boom. Yeah. It explodes and it gives you the date and location. You're like, like, you're like you, you it, it takes you completely off guard. Oh, totally. Completely. And and the fact that if, if you were there at that time, you know, and I'm, I'm using this for a, like a lot of movies that portray real situations of explosions and uh, terrorist attacks. Watching that pub explode, you're just, you're taken back to if you knew about it. And for me, I like, I grew up in the 80s, so we did read about the IRA bombings and things going on, war on the streets. But because you, you don't really see it, you don't understand it. When you see it in a film, you're like, oh, okay, this is real. Yeah, especially the scenes that follow where we then go back to uh, to Belfast. Yeah. And uh, we see Jerry Conlon, you know, and he's he's playing <laughs> he's playing air guitar. Well, he, he's <laughs> he, he's also stealing scrap off the roof. True, true. You know, he's scavenging to survive, but the it's music... What, it's what alerts then the, uh, the, the British military that are there looking for the IRA. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they think he's a sniper. And it, and it leads to this, like, massive chase around the city streets of Belfast. And you're just like, this actually happened. This was real. You know, it's it, it's it still feels so strange seeing all those tanks and soldiers just running down normal, everyday civilian streets and just watching everyday people trying to go to school, go shopping. Yes. And yeah. you've got all of this just going on around you on a daily basis. It really is like a... It is only a it's, small it's window a war zone, man. this. It is a war it's, zone. It's a war zone. And, and the fact that as, at the same time you've got the IRA spotters who see this. Now, Jerry's not really doing anything other than just stealing some scrap to make some money. You know, um, and yeah, he could get a job, but we'll understand why he doesn't do that. Because, you know, he's really got not many choices at this time. And so when he's racing through the houses and then he gets captured and they're, they are kind of threatening him with death itself you know, for kind of ruining their operations and the way that they're trying to take on the police. You, I, I'd like, I don't want to dwell on it too too much or, or go too deep into it. But for me, sometimes I look at stuff like this and I'm like, are they freedom fighters? Are they terrorists? Who really are the good guys here? You know, who are the, the innocents, I suppose? And you're looking at Jerry and he and his father, played by Pete Postlethwaite, you know, when his daughter runs into the shop and she's like, Dad, the IRA have got Jerry and he's just gone. He's, he's up the road. You know, that's love, that is. That's the dad putting himself in a terrible... When he's with the white flag yeah. across the road oh, trying no. to get past the crowd. Oh, man. We're getting you out of here. And the family, you know, they come up with the idea of just sending Jerry to England. You know, it's safer... I suppose, than Northern Ireland, but there's bombings happening over there. You know, hopefully he can go get a job, you know, learn some respect, grow up a bit. I, I really like that. Like, weirdly enough, Daniel Day-Lewis doesn't really age through the movie over the telling of time. Uh, he, he does. I mean, you. The, the thing is, visibly, he doesn't... That's you know, what I'm saying. He, his yeah. appearance will change ever so slightly, but over the course of the film... The character evolves and changes inside because of all the things him. that will happen to him. Yeah, yeah inside him. You know, Jerry but at the start... He delivers is... the visible performance of a transformation there. Yeah, like, well, at the start, like, when he's walking down the dock with Giuseppe, and he's, you know, they're sending him away. You know, it, we, we say it all the time, don't we? It was a different time. So in the 70s, Giuseppe doesn't know really how to show love to his son. But he... Loves him, but he's got to send them away for his own safety. Jerry, as a kid, 20, 
23, 24, I'm not too sure at this time, you know, growing up in a war zone, surrounded by people dying, uh, possibly constantly, you know, and he doesn't know how to show his love to his dad. But you get that moment because we're hearing all of this being replayed in a narration as he's telling it to Emma Thompson's character, uh, Garrett Pierce, and she's she's got the tapes that we will obviously, the film will lead us to how he's recording all this. And he's telling her about like, he turns and he wished he'd shouted louder, but his dad carried on walking. And then he meets up with Paul Hill, uh, played by John Lynch. I looked at this guy's list and as soon as I saw hardware, I was like, shades. <laughs> yep. Oh, man, <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> And it's just all fun and games for them, you know. They just want to go to London and party, you know. Pretty it's the much, 70s. they end up like I, I kind of, I don't know how, but they end up going to like a shared house. Well, he when they get to London, Paul doesn't know where. Well, Paul doesn't have anywhere to stay, so uh, Jerry's just like, "Well, I've got to go to my auntie's." But I've been told by another friend of ours, Paddy, uh, played by Mark Shepard um, from fucking Battlestar Galactica, and they're um, they're in this shared house. There's like eight. 15 people just squatting in this house you know it seemed like a free-for-all like a party house smoking and smoking and drinking and just you know they're all about free love but when paul and jerry walk in you know one of the girls who um i actually recognized as the actress from deep blue sea right um she turns and she's kind of taken back by jerry and another one of the guys doesn't like this you know because she's supposed to be his but it's all about free love. I, I don't understand it myself. But we get established that, you know, Jerry and Paul are here to have fun. You know, and I think when they take the meat to the aunties, because <laughs> everyone's supposed to be vegan. And then they just they got sausages and <laughs> so they go to the other room to eat it. <laughs> but, but they start hanging out with the hippies. And, and, and they, they just, you know, taking drugs and hanging out in the park. And you get that situation as well where they're in the park playing and then you hear the explosion in the distance yes yeah uh bd edney uh playing carol um i reckon her as well as heather from highlander and once they leave because they just they just decide that they can't stay there anymore you know the arguments about the bombings and them being irish among the english they leave and they just end up on a park bench of the night of the bombing and they meet up with a tramp you know charles and he explains to him look this is my bench you're gonna have to leave i carved my name on it and so they do and you have this whole situation then where you're, you're cutting back and forth to the team of ira members as well setting up their bombs and getting ready to take them but then you have jerry and paul coming across the prostitute's wallet you know she's she doesn't want to have anything to do with them so they just take her keys and they enter her house <laughs> him whipping like I've never seen Daniel I, I, like I said I can't remember seeing Daniel Day-Lewis whipping and getting a vibrator out and sitting in a <laughs> wig you know <laughs> and then we, we then cut back to Belfast and he is well I guess he's splashed out on his money oh. because he's looking pretty pretty bling he is pimp <laughs> You know, and he comes in and he's waving the money around to his family. You know, I mean, the, the dad did he like. I mean, the, for me, this is very much also like Pete Postlewaite's movie. Yes, yeah. And, like just, I mean, I like just watching his micro expressions, his reactions, his excitement, his love for his son coming oh, back, yeah. his his worry, and then his questions at the sight of the money and his appearance and everything else, and like oh, all of that comes man. across in like three seconds. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and then we do get you know the more relaxed family behaviour. But then they start seeing it on the news. Yeah. The explosion of the pub. Then on the news that some of the other people that have been there have already been arrested. I love the fact that they'd mentioned that him and Paul had bought the same clothes. So then the daughter the mentions about the yes. shoes on, on the TV. And he's like, what? And we'd seen a snippet of, of the, the, the hippie guy who kind of hated on Jerry when he first turned up. Leaking this information to the police. That set them up yeah. in a way, yeah. And immediately as well, like the, the, the Terrorism Act is in place that the police can obviously hold people for an undisclosed amount of time. Seven days. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. seven days, you know, and just interrogate them without charging them, which obviously we know now is completely wrong and brutal. But 
how many times have I seen this before in other countries? How many other times have people done this to obviously get information regarding these uh, things that are happening, these the, the war on the streets? But watching the police kick down Jerry's door, rush upstairs, grab him at gunpoint, and drag him downstairs to the armored cars, I... I don't know what it was. I was like, man, I swear I've seen that before in The Pianist. You know, I swear I saw the same thing, you know, back in back in World War II. But it's just the horror. Pete Possible, the way he's, he's stood on the doorstep ready to run after his son. Absolutely. But he is dying. Let's just get that clear right now. Pete Possible's character, Giuseppe, is dying. He's got lung cancer or some kind of damage to his lungs that his breathing is just bad. And... He's now got to rush to England to try to obviously get a lawyer for his son who's been grabbed by the police and uh, being held in an undisclosed location. And this is where the film, you know, it, uh, the film's already been fairly hard going, mm. but th some of these sequences are, are 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 brutal to watch because of how amazing Daniel Day Lewis is yeah. in in performing this. And like I said earlier about how he literally underwent like self torture to be able to, to deliver this part and it's because this is the point in the film that it really is make or break for the whole story mm. and that is where the police have said here is your statement you have confessed to blowing up this pub killing these four or five people and injuring all of these other people that were there yeah you did it you've confessed to it now just sign your name and he's like i'm not signing it why would i sign yeah, it yeah i was never there and, yeah. uh, and and you know you'd think to yourself like why would he destroy his entire life by signing it when he is innocent? He's an innocent man. Why would he sign it? And it's because of the seven days of abuse and torture and everything else. And then it's this point. This point that, you know, it, it's upsetting just hearing it when he oh, says, God. I'm going to take a gun and I'm going to go and kill your father if you don't sign these papers right now. Yeah, like, what was this guy? Gerard... McSunley playing Detective Pavis, I don't get what he was doing. Like, he was tr he was being coerced by his commander to make them confess. Yeah, I mean, like, they wanted these people to confess. It would have just been easier just to fucking investigate the bombings instead of spending this amount of time forcing four people to confess to something which everybody in that room knows they didn't do. There's no way. There is no evidence. But the public demands blood. The public wants but a did, lynching. But, and so the yeah, government's well, like, well, course, we need to find them straight of away. Of course they Of course they did. But you can't... Like, the public would have demanded a lynching anyway. But the public already knew that the war in Ireland was wrong. And just the British shouldn't have been there. Even the British army knew they shouldn't have been there when they started looting, lo losing soldiers. And these police officers, especially like Chief Inspector Dixon, you know, he's just the biggest dick throughout the whole fucking movie. Yeah, he, he but is. And, and, and again, that, he has to be. That character never existed in reality. Um, so yeah, that's one yeah. of the criticisms is that, he, that he's not a real person but he is a, a, a um, an embodiment of he's everything in He's an embodiment in there. of like 15 different police officers. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. it, uh, so it is real but of course it just gives you that one person then to project all of your hatred but towards. When, but when he stood there like I said with Detective Pavis and he's like he needs to confess. And Pavis is like, I'm like, what, Pavis, why, what, why are you forcing? Because he walks in there and he puts the gun in his mouth. I'm going to yeah. shoot your dad. And everyone's like, oh, he's acting up. Let's just sign it. And Jerry just breaks. I'm going to shoot your dad. What did you say to me? But I'm like, but it's then the later on sequences where when the information comes back, you know, Pavis is like, he kind of walks off in his situation, like, like, he he knew it was wrong, but I'm like, you stood there with a fucking gun in your mouth, you know, like, what was this supposed to tell me? I'm going to believe you. And as well that Giuseppe has come to the UK and met up with the auntie, you know, because he's looking to get a lawyer and they're all sat around their, their front room. I believe it, they're, they're the Maguire Seven, mm. you know, they're all sat around their front room 
having tea, talking about how to get lawyers, and all of a sudden, bang, door goes, a bunch of fucking armed men come into your house. You pull a fucking small child out of his bed and then give up the idea that he has spent his time making bombs to blow up a pub. Like... I'm not a smart man, but I'm not a fucking idiot. Even that couldn't have been... There was corruption on a scale that nobody... Nobody was ever going to change anything at this point. They were just... They were in and out of jail. And the court case... Oh, man, that's harrowing. Oh, it is brutal. Like, there is, you know... There's, like, no defence. Or a very weak defense, and even though he tried, they, like well, I mean, he tried. It, it's the fact, like the, you know, the, the the case was, you know, the, they knew the the verdict before even going in there. Oh yeah, yeah. And so even though, like, there was loads of holes in the in the uh, in the the prosecution's case, like the defense had a strong case of like it should have been thrown out. That's where Dixon, like I said, Dixon is the fucking prick because he stands yeah. there and he goes oh yes but we've got all this evidence because my name alone you know and just my police officers would never and, lie and it is it we is, it is harrowing them. it is brutal when the sentences start to get given out 30 years to life 30 years to life 30 years to life to a kid to <laughs> a fucking kid <laughs> and like the old like like the auntie the old lady it's she like, like 15 years 15 years because they found traces of nitroglycerine glycerine on, on her, her gloves. rubber gloves are you fucking insane like i've seen some shit in a movie that's unbelievable but this is a fucking oh. <laughs> sometimes reality is stranger oh, isn't it oh man and like i said when we get to you know yes when they go to prison the, in real in reality, Giuseppe is sent to one prison and Jerry is sent to another. Um, but everything I see in the prison, regardless, is real to me. It, it, it's just so real, you know, just walking down those steps and everybody's shouting from their cells about how they're going to fucking, they're going to kill you because they believe it as well, don't they? Everybody in that prison believes it, that Jerry and his father are part of the bombing uh, yeah. squad. Yeah, because the first time they go down into like the mess hall, the, the main area, they get kicked right back into their own cells to oh, eat their man. meals. Frank Harper as Ronnie Small, the <laughs> leader of the wing in the prison. You've right. always got to have a hard man. And this guy plays a hard man really well. But, he, you know, they're, they're all really good. And it comes on later on because they can't leave their cell. Uh, they've got to stay in there for their own protection, I suppose, because everyone wants to kill them. Because it's an English prison as yeah, well. Yeah, so. um, oh, yeah. You had that part with the judge, didn't you, where he's just like, I wish I could try you for treason and have you hanged. Right. I'm like, I 1974, know. what the fuck? You've got nothing else to do than hang people? Fuck. Uh, just, uh, I don't know. Penal colony? I don't know. Yeah, penal <laughs> colony. That'd be all right. Those work. But it's it's... It's now the the human drama between between the you know father and son. Oh yeah, you know watching it's it's the conversations where they just you know they they Giuseppe, the acceptance of the fact that they're going to be in here for life. But Giuseppe won't give up hope. He won't. But he watches his son immediately wander off and start dropping acid. Wait, yeah, you know, cause... start taking drugs, and it's just like he's I, trying to look after his son. I'm sorry, I like. At the same time, like I like I love Pete Possel's weight, but I would have liked to have seen Pete Possel's weight maybe drop a jigsaw piece. <laughs> because that moment helped establish that everybody was going to believe them after a while. You know, they they you know, Jerry walks into the room uh, and he hooks up with the guy. I, I I can't remember the actor's name, but um I mean he's been in a hell of a lot. He's a great another British actor. I remember him mainly from uh the, the Neverwhere TV series, if you, if you remember that one. That's what I remember him from. Um, and he convinces Jerry to drop the acid. And they sit there and they just spend the day smoking weed. And they're just like, look, we kind of believe you that you didn't do this. Because it just seems like you wouldn't do it. You know, you just seem such like a laid back guy. And then when he goes back to his cell and his dad's praying for him. I get that. I you know. Yeah, I get why he's praying for him, but then he's just having such fun with it <laughs> with the bugle charge. Oh, get the cavalry. Wait for Dad. some cavalry. Yeah. You know, and you the time passes a, a little bit jarring, I think. But yeah, at the we, same time, it's not it clear. To... It's not clear to us how much time has passed until somebody says how many years it's been. Yeah, or the seasons change. Mm. You know, or their relationships change. Well, the 
the thing that really signifies the the time of changing now is watching is watching Giuseppe's illness and watching his health deteriorate mm. over the over the next you know several scenes. But we're also at the same time we're also following Emma Thompson's character who's trying to investigate this this stuff outside. I was going to say yeah we see her um, because she was there at the court. And she was like one of the ones that's going, well, this makes no sense. Yeah. And yeah. she was the one who goes to the park, finds the bench. Finds the bench. Finds the carving of the name. Yeah. But then she almost disappears for what felt like an hour of the film. Yeah. And kept popping up here and there uh, but, until she became like a, an integral part of the story. That's then. it. Because she's still hearing the narration. Yes. And, and once Giuseppe gets involved with Garrett's character, because we have one of the IRA actual bombers be sent to the prison because he tells the police, he says to Dixon, he says, yeah, you didn't, I did it. You got two innocent men in there. So we're like, we're told in the movie, yeah, they knew, but they just let him sit there because how could they release these people? It would be wrong, wouldn't it, for their judicial system to be looked at negatively. Hmm. Uh, well, we did get rid of the guillotine, but that's a, I'm not going to, I'm dwelling. But this this other uh, IRA leader comes in and he tells Giuseppe and he tells Jerry, like, look, I'm the one who bombed them and you guys are innocent. And Giuseppe turns around and he's just like, leave us alone. I, I can't, I'm not going to stand by a man who's murdered innocent people. I don't care. But at the same time, Jerry is almost infatuated with him because this guy is now become like the top dog uh, of, of the prison. The, he's you know? the new father figure that Jerry doesn't believe Giuseppe is. Yeah. Um, but we've had those moments where it just keeps coming back with memory after memory of, you know, Jerry remembering things when he was a kid. Yeah. yeah. You know, oh, I remember you, we were used to ride up the bike up the hill, but now you can't do it because you can't breathe, you know, and that's because I mean, of your lungs and blah, blah, blah. There are some amazing amazing monologues and speeches and, and conversations between the two of them. Yeah. And it, the raw emotion just comes out. It really, like, that one moment where Giuseppe does slap oh, his yeah. son. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, just beat me like a real no, father man. would. And, uh, you know, and, and that, again, it's one of the things, like, going back to what I said right at the start of the, this video, is yeah. that um, the director said, okay, yeah, so maybe I did lie. Maybe I didn't tell this whole story about the, the four that went to prison for the bombing they didn't commit. But he said, that's not the story I wanted to tell. And the story I wanted to tell was, was about story? a parent that used non-violence to resolve his issues. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, in a scene like this one just really helps encapsulate... The story that the director, writer, wanted to see in, in these events. Yeah. The only I'm saying is that you've been a victim all your life. It's about time you started the fight, Doug. No, my sight. I'm going. And it, and it comes back again when um, the, the, the IRA leader, he's, he's had his chat with Ronnie, like, you don't mess with the Irish or we're going to kill your family. And you think Ronnie's going to fucking take him down, but he's just like, all right, you're all right. I'll let you go for a moment. And then it's when they're watching The Godfather and they've set it up so that the, the chief of the, 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 the prison is actually going to be in the room playing with the, the projector. And while he's distracted, they just cover him with petrol and then set him on fire. And he runs around on fire. It's a fucking terrifying scene. Um, but Jerry stops him. Now, I'm not sure if this is real or not. If if this actually did happen in the prison. Or, you know, maybe the IRA leader was never even there. I don't know. But what it does establish for me is that Jerry is not a murderer. He hates the English. He hates the prison system. He hates everybody, but he's not going to let a man he's die. He's horrified at what he's just witnessed. Horrified. It's yeah. I mean, he's crying yeah. from what he's just witnessed. And he turns on the IRA leader and walks away. And then you start to watch the other prisoners go as well. They abandon this, this fight, you know, somebody else's fight. And then when he confronts Giuseppe, you know... We've been following people Oswald's character writing these letters and he has that moment where he's like, Dad, I want to help. Right. And that's what leads then into, uh, you know, the appeals and trying to get into the cases. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, God, Emma Thompson going into the basement. Oh, you're going to have one piece of paper at a time. Right. If you need photocopies 
I would I'll be the one to do it. But you. you can, because, you know, dickhead McGee's in the back there making sure that she's, you know, to, denied access to the key paperwork. She knows if she gets any of it. And and maybe, Dan, maybe that's the most brilliant thing is because he's not real, because it, he's the embodiment of so many police, to officers, police officers. Yeah, yeah. There, everybody, the, the entire police force. Everybody, was in everybody on it. must have now, known at some point. There is one one scene, I guess that I like. I was trying to think this whole time of any negatives I have for the whole film. There's yeah. very little to none, except the one I've just thought of now, where because she's denied access, she comes up with a plan. I think she sneezes on a piece of paper. No, no, no. She's She's been out in the rain. Right. And the rain's so she's made her cold, cold, or... cold, cold, and then she's But she passes in. the paper, and then, you know, whatever, whatever. But then she comes back the next day, and it turns out that the guy that she gave that paper to is has off now, sick. Has now got so it's just like, did that really work? Did, it? did that did it? plan but work? Because now she, she gets access must to the have, other files. Yeah, because she must have got hold of this file. And that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I'm i not entirely sure what to believe anymore. I just know that four people innocently got sent to prison. The police tried to cover it up. And then they got found to be innocent and were exonerated yeah. of it. But it, it does build up to that moment. Because she's just like, all right, can I have that folder, please? And he brings the folder to her. And she gets a stack a of paper. And she takes one herself. And we see the note that says, do not show this to the defense. That's the big moment. That's the big moment where, you know, the entire case. It's like it's, that's all the evidence you need. Why would you still have that? Why, Why not just, just destroy, destroy it, it right. immediately? Why have you been Why holding you hide on it? To, yeah. to holding on to it? And then they didn't even hide it in a good place. You hide it in the place where you put archives. So when the person <laughs> comes walking in saying, I need access to it, like fucking Joe was going to sit there well, and go, did, oh, yeah, I'm not supposed to show that. I'm going to keep it. Is that what they did? They put it. They put it in a different name file so that you wouldn't look. You would have found it by accident. Yeah, but uh, it was just a small like. It's not really trivia. It's not really. It's just a bit of fun. If you're if you're a fan of supernatural, right, right, and a fan of Mark Shepard, yeah. When she's going through the files, yeah, there's one of the files says Crowley. Uh-huh. Which was Mark Shepard's name in that, and there's also a Cassidy there as well. So I was just like, oh. Ma- nice. ma- it made me laugh. Nice, um, but we've also just watched, like we said, we've watched Giuseppe slowly deteriorate, and and over the course of the movie, he's been uh, beaten by the police officers at some points. He can't even make it down the stairs, and we have the moment where he does pass away in the middle of the night. And I suppose the the new prison warden and the guards do their best. If you can say that, but they they move Jerry. Jerry just goes back to his cell and he's just sat there. And the priest comes in and says, "Look, sorry, son, but your father's dead." Oh man, like it's it's just it's soul destroying because you've had this relationship that's you know that's butted heads and you know and then come together. They they've learned from each other. They've helped each other. They've loved each other. And then his illness finally catches up with him and he dies. And watching Daniel Day Lewis, watching watching Jerry Conlon break, and uh, you know, and you know, it's upsetting as it is, because the film has done nothing really but depict some of the worst in humanity. You know, it's enough to make you question the legal system, enough to make you question your governments, question all everything. all of that shit. Yeah, and uh, and then. Like, in a place where you would least expect it, to see a wave of compassion and humanity from all of these prisoners. When Beg Bay, you know, just starts shouting from his window, you know, they killed Giuseppe. For Giuseppe, yep. And just, you know, the, 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 the fires, the embers, you know, just falling out of the prison windows. Man, like, it will, it will, it will... It will break your soul just a little bit. Yeah. It's, it's tough. It's very good, though. Very good. And, you know, just visually as well, like the, the lighting, the cinematography, it's beautifully captured and beautifully scored. And I, I really love that You only have it briefly, uh, like a couple times, but I really love the development of uh, Garrett's uh, and... Um, Jerry's relationship, especially through Emma Thompson uh, and Daniel Day Lewis, like when he first meets him, he's just like, "Don't give my dad hope," you know. And then, like the second time they meet him, he's more positive, you know. He's got a bit more in one idea. But then when Giuseppe dies, he's like, you know, what's the fucking point? And she's like, "We need to get them off on the stand." And he's, he's 
boost it because he wants to, you know, clear his father's name. He, he, he wants to get out. They try moving him to Scotland at one point and she stood there in the court. She's like, I haven't seen him for two months. What's going on? Why is this happening? And you're just watching more and more of the people on the street. Like, that I remember growing up in the 80s is seeing that on the, the news. The protests. Yeah. Seeing the protests and thinking, why are these people still in prison? And not understanding it. And maybe... Yeah, maybe I am a bit naive of, you know, what it was like back then and how terrible it was and why people did these things. But we've already established that these people were lying. They were covering it up. They were hiding the information. And so when they finally get them back on the stand, like I said, I like, I didn't really see them change age much until you brought back, you know, Carol and Paul and Roman Lampkin, <laughs> Paddy, um, when, you, when you have them there and they just look so drawn in and they just look defeated, so defeated and so different, you know, they're not the happy go lucky kids they were before, you know, and Emma Thompson starts listening off to the chief of the police, Dixon, you know, he doesn't <laughs> exist, but he's there. <laughs> He's now the figurehead for the whole system. Again, again, this this whole final scene in the court, yeah, heavily criticised because it follows no court procedures. There's characters in the courtroom that shouldn't have ever been there, you know, and it's all it's all is what really she said is, is what exactly she said no, true. It is, is what really she said true. Beautifully dramatised though, and it you know like the 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 speeches, you know, the way that it's filmed, the way that it's captured, it really just crescendos, yeah, beautifully well. And watching all the other barristers scrabbling around to find out what's going on yeah watching the judge as well obviously it's not the same judge that put him away no no but no. watching him con oh, have been control over years. the court exactly it's been 15 years from the first court case to this court case but then watching the villainous bastards that put them in jail you know watching oh, them sweating shitting. because you, they're, they're like why have we still got this <laughs> right. why have we still got why does this still exist it does it all bubbles and crescends beautifully you know when when they come out to give the final verdict you know yeah. you know you're just like you're just waiting to hear it and they all get you know they all get the sentences just thrown out And yeah. you, you know, it, it, all that emotion, all that build up as Jerry's just like walks over the benches, forces himself past security and out the front. Yeah, start talking I'm going to out the front the press. door. I'm, I'm free man. I'm going yeah. out the front door. It's like, oh. And, you know, and, and, and he does. And he's just like, all of this in the name of the father. Yeah. You know, and I was like, and that's it, credits. He said the he said the title of the film. He said what it was all about. Well, we get that those little title cards as well, giving us a bit more information of what happened, um, you know, after how the Guildford Four all went off to try to continue their lives. I mean, you know, what's happened after the film has come out you know that's you know speculation or, or, or questioning or what people want to know what unfortunately jerry conlon passed away yeah yeah uh, in june of 2014 in uh. belfast at the age of 60 mm. but uh you know he he was at that at that point a millionaire from the from from compensation nice. oh. from from the royalties but um, you know he had the money to to splash out and enjoy himself after 15 years of of, of the shit that he went through yeah but at yeah. the same time he had to take drugs or he took drugs because of he had nightmares every single night mm. he, you know uh, the the horrors of the things that the he went through might come and get him again exactly you know? so i mean he was a he was a broken destroyed man but then in comparison to that sequence with giuseppe where he's like i promise that i won't do any of that stuff again i'm like yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but it's still like they all they all try to go off, and then it, it explains as well that nobody is actually being prosecuted for that's the real for the bombing or horror. for these because well, like we said, these are these are fifteen twenty people. This is a maybe a whole wing of the police force. Some of them have probably left. Some of them have died. You know, it's. it's, it's it's oh let's just move on we've it's dealt with now you know he's been compensated they've all been taken care of we, we, we don't talk about it anymore and it's like well just watch the film and then we'll talk about it yeah. i will fight on in the name of my father and of the truth yeah. well Liam, what were your favorite scenes from the film oh man um <sighs> Yeah, I, I had a list. I had a list of, of sequences, but like really just thinking back on them now, most of them are just really Daniel Day Lewis. Like Daniel Day Lewis and Pete Postlewaite together is just amazing. 
Like, I'm trying not to get emo emotional every time I think about them on screen. Um, so I'll jump to, like, him and Emma Thompson. <laughs> you know, him and Emma Thompson together. Because that kind of chills me out. Like, him and, him and Romo Lampkin. Him and Shades hanging out. I love, 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 love any fucking sequence that anywhere that just involves Jimi Hendrix. So that whole sequence at the beginning with Voodoo Child. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are so many, so many I just... poignant, <laughs> amazingly delivered scenes in the film, either from the actors or from the production team or from the director or from the editor. Mm -hmm. It's it's beautifully, beautifully made. Um, I would say the opening explosion will definitely get your attention from the get go, and you'll see that explosion twice. Yes, there's this the, the again the the torture sequence with Jerry Conlon when he's just like, "I'm innocent. Why are you doing this to me?" Yeah, like the 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 disbelief, you know, an innocent man seeing his whole reality crumbling down when people that he might have looked up to or respected are doing this to him falsely. It's um like just feeling that that betrayal mm. and his delivery of it all really really well done like I said it's a poignant moment where he has to sign it because that's where the whole rest of the film goes as a result of him signing that paper mm. the uh, Giuseppe sequence with his son when he's you know when he's uh, when he's filling up the, the, the hot water with the Vicks vapor rub <laughs> you know va vaping it you know rubbing his dad down yeah, I'm it, it, I know it was, it's the final scene together before you know he passes away yeah uh, but just the dialogue the conversations like they they, they, they were so meaningful. And at this point, Jerry was now mature enough to really understand what his dad was, was fighting for or, or believing in. Yeah, the tobacco hand. Yes, oh, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful. Uh, Niagara Falls, man. Uh, Niagara, Niagara Falls. Falls. Um, and I think one of my other favorite scenes as well was um, with uh, with Jerry Conlon talking to the lawyer where he, you know she's talking about what needs to be done. And he's like, I don't even fucking understand the English language anymore. <laughs> you know, and he lists off all of these words. Yeah. And he's like, they have no meaning mm. anymore for him. And like, again, it's just super poignant. And it for me, it's just like how well written the characters are. Like, I don't know what sort of things would come out of the real Jerry Conlon's mouth. I've not actually read his book, but the way he's written and the way he's performed here, you really believe him and you mm. really root for him as yeah. well. Um, and so, yeah, these sequences and Daniel Day-Lewis just magnificent. You see, I, I don't understand your language. Justice, mercy, clemency. I, I literally don't understand what those words mean. Well, Ian, do you recommend in the name of the Father? Oh, fucking hell yeah. Um, like I said, I have been a big fan of Daniel Day Lewis ever since I've seen uh, My Left Foot, and I totally fucking recommend that one. We totally need to do that motherfucking movie someday, but. You know, these two guys work so well together. Everybody who works with Daniel Day-Lewis, like, it just seems they they just pull their absolute best out of, out of them. And even if they're only on the screen for a short period, like, like just the sequences with his mum, I can't remember the actress's name, but she just, she was just made to be so emotional as a mum who's seen her husband and her son go to prison for something they didn't do and nobody cares nobody's listening you know and you're just watching it through the movie i really don't want to talk about pete possibly and fucking daniel day lewis again because i will burst into tears right now so i will just finish by saying if you are a fan of film and cinema and you have never seen any movie by Daniel Day Lewis or this movie, you know, or you know, you start within the name of the father if you if we're really gonna go, because you just need to know. You 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 just need to know. Yeah, without a doubt, I'm gonna be recommending in the name of the father. And it may be tough viewing at times, and it can get very emotionally charged. But your investment into the characters makes it all the while. This story, yeah, might be fictionalised and dramatised uh -huh. and, and rightly criticised for not being fully accurate. But it doesn't diminish how much of a fantastic job they did in doing so. It's brilliantly condensed narrative, quick pace, great editing and cinematography, fantastic direction and an amazing score and kick-ass soundtrack ties this all together really well. The performances of the whole cast were great, but 
Daniel Day-Lewis and Pete Postlewaite were truly stars. Mm -hmm. So emotionally invested into their characters, the two leads gave career-defining brilliance here. The story, the characters, with excellent production, it's really powerful cinema. It's the reason to love and watch all films. Mm -hmm. Even if the subject matter is shocking and, uh, and it highlights injustice in the world, you know, it, it has to be seen. So, yes, highly recommending this gem of a film to everybody about a man falsely accused, wrongly imprisoned, who fought for justice to clear his father's name. Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. Man and I'm going out the front door.